Bow your heads in a word of prayer. Merciful, gracious, loving God, we thank you for the privilege to listen to your word again. We pray that you would open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our minds that we may understand, and open our spirits that we may obey. For all of this we ask in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This particular passage of scripture we just heard from the Gospel of Luke, actually the context of this uh, starts off in verse 17 of the sixth chapter. Most of us know the Sermon on the Mount. Most of us will readily know that uh, that sermon was uh, preached by Jesus from the Mount of Beatitudes and recorded by Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7. A very beautiful passage, a very powerful sermon, something that uh, we have time and again visited even as uh, we encourage each other on the journey of faith. What we have here in Luke chapter 6 is a counterpart to the Sermon on the Mount and scholars and Bible commentators have called this the Sermon on the Plain because verse 17 says he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples the great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him, to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came from him and healed all of them. And then in the context of this preaching and teaching and healing, Jesus takes his disciples aside. So what follows from verse 20 onwards is not so much for the crowds. It is not for the multitudes. It is for those whom he had just chosen, the selected 12, the disciples, whom he called to leave their homes, their families, their businesses, their affairs, in order to become harbingers or messengers of the kingdom. Even to this day, we follow that practice when people hear the call of God in their lives, they respond by entering into a seminary for a period of three years. I think the pattern comes from following Jesus and in his ministry for at least two and a half years, maybe three years for the early disciples. We still do that. So these were the disciples to whom Jesus begins to address what follows. The reason I believe that Jesus isolates them and brings them aside and he brings this message to them is because he wanted them to understand who they were being called to. They were being invited into a new thing. They were being called to be the heralds, the forerunners, if you will, of his work in this world. Jesus knew that his time was very limited. He knew that in just a matter of a couple of years, his earthly ministry would end and he would have to return. 
but he needed to entrust his message and entrust his work into the hands of these chosen men. And it was important for Jesus to make sure that they understood who they were being called to be. Now, by application, may I say that it applies to all of us. Just as much as Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and all the others were called and separated and given this understanding of who they were being called to do, to be and to do, you and I are the same. You and I have been chosen of God, selected by God, called apart to be the church. You've been chosen, you've been selected. If the grace of God has come to you, and if the knowledge of Jesus Christ has come upon you that he is your personal Savior and Lord, you are the audience to what Jesus wants to say. He's not saying this to the world. He's not even saying this to the multitudes and the crowds that were somewhat interested in what he was saying, what he was doing, because of uh, the, the attraction that it generated. No, these disciples were singled out in as much as you and I. You are the church. You are the body of Christ. In this calling, I believe there is no distinction between ordained clergy and laity. It's all the same. We are not covered under some kind of a special policy. It is the same. It is the same blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross that covers me and gives me the right and the privilege to be a servant of God as much as you are. Of course, you're not ordained to serve the church, but you're ordained of God to be servants in the world. So let me take you on this uh, brief journey as we look at this uh, passage of scripture, beginning at verse 27. If you have your Bible, you can open and follow along. If you don't, just listen as I Read the scripture. Jesus, addressing the disciples, says, But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Now let me just pause right there. This is not an easy thing for the disciples to hear. Who? can love an enemy. How can I love my enemy? I can't even love my neighbor. You want me to love my enemy? Someone who has made it his or her life's purpose to destroy me? Yes, that's what I want you to do, says Jesus. This is a new thing, my friends. This is a new thing. The disciples were probably perplexed, confused. What kind of a teaching is this? You want us to love our enemies? Didn't the law say that if somebody took your eye, what do you do? You take their eye, right? Tooth for, tooth, eye for, and eye. But I say unto you, Love your enemy. I would have expected half of them to say, this is not for us, and left Jesus. He would have let them go. Many are called, but few are chosen, right? This is a very difficult uh, message for anyone to hear. Especially in this day when everybody is fighting for their own rights, when everybody is taking their own ground for whatever it is that they are you know, standing for, 
of fighting for. Nobody wants to be taken advantage of. Love your enemies. Then he goes on to explain, give an illustration, give a commentary on it. Do good to those who hate you. Wow. Who does that? If you know somebody who hates you, do you do good to them? Absolutely. If you're a follower of Jesus, you do nothing short, nothing less. On the other hand, if you're not doing that, then question yourself. Am I a follower of Jesus Christ? My following my Lord. He continues in verse 28, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Hmm. Sometimes we can't even handle one critical word about us. One critical word. Go and do something else. Don't claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ if you cannot do this. Because this is a requirement, not a suggestion. Not some kind of a friendly advice that, you know, if you say you are a follower of Jesus, try your best. Do, do what you can. I know it's not easy. I know, you know, some of the people in your life are horrible people. And they're going to make your life hell. Every opportunity they get. But, you know, try to overlook. Try, try, try to not mind them. Try to tolerate them as best as you can. Because after all, we are human beings. God understands. Mana reasoning chana convincing onto the problem. We convince ourselves this is not practical, this is not for real. Who does this today? Then he goes on. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. Old Testament, going, going, going back there, right? Tooth for tooth, eye for eye. If somebody strikes you on the cheek, strike one back. Some people even have added some masala to that. If somebody strikes you, strike them back so hard that they will not make another attempt to come at you. Hmm. Not if you're a follower of Jesus. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. If somebody grabs your jacket by force, you have not given it to them. You haven't said, brother, you know, here, have my coat. But they kind of grabbed, you know, it, it from you. They've, they've pulled it off of your back. What Jesus is saying is, offer them your shirt too. Are you, are you nuts? What belongs to you, somebody has grabbed it and taken it by force, and you want me to give them my shirt also? What kind of ethics is this? What kind of uh, a life is this? Jesus, are you serious? Do you really mean this? And Jesus will look in the eye and say yes. If you cannot do this, this is not for you. If you cannot take up the cross, follow me, 
live my example, obey my commands. You cannot be my disciple. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We all know the golden rule. Do unto others what you would have them do to you. And then, as if this argument was not enough, or as if this argument was not convincing enough for the disciples, Jesus goes on to say, well, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? I mean, if, if somebody is nice to you and you're nice to them back, I mean, it's equal, right? There, there's nothing more that you have done. You've simply reciprocated what good the other person has done to you. What credit is that to you? In what way are you different? I know a lot of people who do a lot of good. And they do it better than many people I know. They have no knowledge of Jesus Christ. They don't do it because of uh, their understanding that they're called to be in the kingdom of God. And if you're part of the kingdom of God, this is what you do. They have absolutely zero understanding. But they're very humanistic. They have human compassion. Manavattvamattam. If you do good only to those who do good back to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. That's a very strong language. Do we, do, do we call anybody who does that a sinner? Somebody who does good? Well, what is the difference? That's the question. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. I can't imagine what the disciples must have been feeling. I, I can't even imagine, imagine what you are feeling sitting there as these words come to, to us. Now, are, are, you, are you feeling excited? Are you feeling this is fantastic? Are you feeling this is great? You know, why don't we do this as often as we can? Why don't we practice this kind of uh, Christianity in our lives? Or are you saying, hmm, does this really mean that? Is there some clause here that I can apply so that I can escape from obeying, or obeying this word? No, my friends. Again, Jesus reiterates what he had said earlier about loving the enemies in verse 27. He repeats that in verse 35. Love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. When was the last time you did something good to somebody and absolutely had no expectation of getting anything back from them? When was the last time you did something to a stranger that you had no idea who he or she was and you did something good without anybody even noticing it? And of course, not expecting anything from that person. When was the last time we did that? Your reward will be great, and he says, and you will be the children of the Most High. That is the designation you get. That is your reward. You are recognized as a child of God, children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. What powerful word is this? God, who is the sovereign one, the king of kings, the 
the, 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 the mighty creator of this universe does kindness. He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. What we think is, uh, I, I will do good as long as at least you show some gratitude. You, you show me some respect. You give me some gratitude and I will be good to you. That's how humans reason. I, I reason that way. Make a confession. If somebody is ungrateful for the good that I have done to them, then my heart says, it's, what's the use? Why, why should I do this? Why should I expend myself for someone's betterment if they don't even have an ounce of gratitude in them for me? Perfectly sound reasoning. But it doesn't fit in the kingdom pattern. It doesn't. You know why it doesn't fit? Because if God were to apply that, same rule, same standard to all of us, how many of us here would be still standing? How many of us here would be still covered under the grace of God? Nobody. Nobody. None of us will be able to stand if God were to remove his kindness or if God were to treat us with kindness and generosity only based upon our gratitude and our thanksgiving. God is merciful, period. Sometimes it's kind of hard for, for that to get through to us. God is merciful. And so, based on that, Jesus says, be merciful. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. He goes on into a lot more behavioral patterns, namely judging other people. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Again, he's speaking of generosity. God is generous. God is not a miser. God doesn't give little by little. God pours upon us his blessings. Look at the language that Jesus uses over here. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. I used to be a uh, gopher for, for my family. You know what a gopher does, right? And go for this and go for that and go do this and go do that. I was a little kid and my mom would give me a list of things from the shop. And I would go to this one Kirana store in in Hyderabad, little kid, and I would go there and give the list to the, uh, the owner of the store. I knew him, he knew our family. I used to love to go to this store because you know, a lot of interesting things happen when you go to the store. You meet a lot of people there and you know, a lot of buzz going on around uh, that, that store. I still remember it's called Swadeshi Kirana stores. This was some 60 years back. But, but I would go there with my list and I would sit down and I would uh, give it to the guy and I would ask him to pack up all the things. And I would watch him, what he would do. How, how is he measuring the cashews and how, how, how is he uh, packing the, the sugar, you know? Is he measuring okay? Is he cheating? Is he shortchanging? Because I'm a little kid, you know, what can I say? How do I know? But the one thing I cannot get out of my mind 
I don't know if anybody else has this experience, but I, I connect this, this passage to that image that I have as a little boy, and, and I would ask him to pour out oil into a bottle that I would carry into the store. And I would have him fill the bottle. And you know, they had these long handle and steel containers that they, he would dip into, into the uh, large container with oil and then he would take it. And I could, I, could, I could literally see as he was pulling that thing up that oil would be dripping from the sides and he would take that and carefully pour that into my bottle. That was it. He could have stopped right there, but then he would dip it back and bring out a little bit more that I wasn't paying for. And he would add that. తెలుగులో ఏమంటారు దాన్ని కోసరు కోసరు పోసేవాడు ఆఫ్టర్ ప్యాకింగ్ వాట్ ఎవర్ వీ వాంటెడ్ ఆర్ నీడెడ్ హీ వుడ్ టేక్ అ హ్యాండ్ ఫుల్ అండ్ పుట్ ఇట్ ఇన్ మై హ్యాండ్ అండ్ ఐ వుడ్ రిసీవ్ దాట్ ఓ అ హ్యాండ్ ఫుల్ ఆఫ్ క్యాషూస్ ఫర్ అ టెన్ ఇయర్ ఓల్డ్ Ah, I would chew them until I went home. I didn't pay for that. But this stranger blessed me. If a, if a stranger who is selling merchant, uh, merchandise can have that heart to bless me, Can you even imagine God? We ask God for this and God says, no, 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 hold the bottle. More is coming. Hold the bottle. More is coming. Hold your hand out. More is coming. I'm going to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. You're asking for this and I'm going to open the barn doors of heaven and pour so much upon you. you would not be able to count. Abraham, I'm going to give you one son. But then through him, you will have so many children, like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. That's how much I'm going to bless you. That is why you need to be merciful that is why you need to be generous that is why you need to love somebody because the love with which god has loved you how can you compare that to the teeny tiny acts of love that you show to somebody else it doesn't compare Friends, I can just go on and on and on, but we have another program today. But <laughs> Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. I have a very uh, fond title for this message. It's the extravagant love of God. It is the outlandish manifestation of the mercy of God. I don't know where you are in your walk with God and I, I, I have no idea of uh, saying or telling you know, how, how, how your walk is with the Lord, but you know, I, I, I have been so blessed that even if I were to pour out my entire life in worship of God, in the service of God, it would amount to nothing. 
అప్పుడప్పుడు నువ్వు వింటా ఉంటాను మీ పాస్ట్ గారు మీరు ఇంత చేస్తున్నారు అంత చేస్తున్నారు అది సున్నా కంపేర్ టు వాట్ గాడ్ హ్యాస్ డన్ అండ్ గాడ్ ఈస్ డూయింగ్ ఇన్ మై లైఫ్ వాట్ ఎమ్ మై డూయింగ్ ఈజ్ నథింగ్ ఇట్స్ లైక్ ఎ గ్రీన్ ఆఫ్ శాండ్ ఆన్ ద బీచ్ God is so gracious. God is so loving. He invites us to follow him. Be loving. Be kind. Be generous. Be merciful. For your heavenly father treats you that way. Pray with me. Lord God we thank you for this uh, word we thank you for the challenge it brings to us so often we treat other people on the basis of their behavior or their uh, responsiveness to us or whatever but lord you tell us to be extravagant in our giving to others may these words continue to ring in our ears continue to tug at our hearts and continue to challenge our response as we go through the journey of life for this we pray and ask in the name of our blessed lord and our savior jesus christ who gave us everything everything yes his very life and for that we offer you our praise and our thanks amen the closing hymn is probably something that uh, we are not very familiar with i'm not sure but it is something that uh, i love to sing fill my cup 